I mean, it's on. Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started, shall we? Um, welcome everybody to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This oh. is the San Francisco Dharma oh. Collective. That's true. That's yes, right. Um, and tonight we're going to dive into a new, a new topic tonight, as always. Uh, quickly, let me just share it with you. The topic tonight is going to be upaya, upaya, otherwise translated as expedient means. You might also know it as skillful means. Um, yeah, there's a kind of a bunch of other random definitions of this that get floated around, but I want to kind of talk tonight about this really interesting idea that doesn't get spoken about, I think, enough. So upaya. Let's start with the word. So it's one of those words, it's one of those ideas that is definitely a part of the earliest forms of Buddhism. So it's going to be one of those ideas that goes all the way back. Interestingly, just doing a little bit of research before we got started. So upaya, just the word upaya, it just means <laughs> means like uh, a, a, a way to do something, but particularly like a, uh, you know, like uh, by by what means did you arrive? <laughs> by a car? By foot? By what means? That's what upaya is, is just a, a, a means. And in looking into the word, I, I found that there's actually a longer word, which is upaya kushala. And that's like, expedient means so <clears throat> the the kushala part just gets dropped and upaya becomes expedient or skillful means and this is one of those words this is going to be a fun word and a fun idea to unpack tonight because it's one of those ideas that kind of means one thing in the early buddhist tradition and then it means something a little different in the later Mahayana Bodhisattva path. And then we're gonna look at an example of it in the sutra that we've been reading. So let's dive into this sort of like the early Buddhist version, later Buddhist version. So in doing some, again, a little bit of research, this is one of those words that is used very seldomly in the early, like the Pali Canon, by which I mean the Pali Suttas, but Upaya is a word that you find a lot in the commentarial literature of the early tradition. But what the word Upaya seems to mean in that early tradition was that it was something, the, 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 the best example would be counting your breaths during a meditation. It's a little technique, it's a little trick, it's a little means to concentrate, a little means to focus. And there's a lot of these in the Pali Canon. And what I mean is, is that the Buddha gave a lot of different advice for say how to meditate or things like that. And then later commentators called those things upaya. But it's not a word that the Buddha seems to use, at least in the early literature. So it's a word used by others to refer to these little techniques that the Buddha taught. But the thing about it is, just like all of these ideas, in the early Buddhist tradition, this was a technique that one used for themselves on themselves. So like counting your breath was something you did to yourself or, you know, literally in your mind to bring about uh, a state of meditation. And what we're going to notice as we kind of proceed this evening, <clears throat> we're going to notice how there's an interesting shift where Upaya in the early tradition is something that's very personal. And in the Bodhisattva path, upaya is something interpersonal. 
it's something it, that's in 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 exchange in that way. So I don't really actually, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't really have a lot more to say about the way upaya is used in the early tradition, because <clears throat> that's that's about it. Yeah, a gnome. So when you first described it, I thought that you were saying that the commentators said that when the Buddha said, count your breath, the Buddha was using skillful means, but that's not what it is. The Buddha just said, count your breath, and counting your breath is a skillful mean that one would choose on when one was decided one needed it. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Now, your question is insightful, though, Noam, because you caught that there is something interpersonal a little bit in that the Buddha taught this technique to the monastic, to the, the bhikshus and bhikshunis. And that's going to come back. In fact, that's exactly where I was headed. So beautiful segue. <laughs> So these little tricks, these little techniques, like counting your breath, or um, <clears throat> another one from the early tradition is the, the kashina, the elemental discs. That's another upaya. It's like another technique for establishing uh, meditation, for establishing mindfulness. So that's how that word is used in the early tradition. But then, as soon as these Mahayana sutras start to appear, and <clears throat> when we start to hear about the Bodhisattva path, Upaya becomes something different. And it, it different in a few uh, interesting, subtle ways. So the first thing that we need to remember or we need to talk about is a major difference between what we call the early path and Mahayana, a really big difference, and it's 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 huge, by the way, in terms of like how this plays out in history. In the early Buddhist tradition, the Buddha is the great guru, the great Mahamuni, the great sage, like. And the, the Buddha taught the Dharma, the teachings, and <clears throat> are, if, if we are involved in, the, in the, that early path or the Theravada, the practice then is to do what the Buddha taught, to like do the techniques and do the meditation. And you kind of, in a way, follow what the Buddha said to do. And that's what the early path is about, following what the Buddha said to do and, and doing it. But something happens over here, and by over here, I mean seemingly like in, in northern India, right? Kind of Afghanistan, Pakistan area. Who knows when? Maybe around 200 BC or so. But in these more northern regions, the idea was. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't do, we're not interested in doing what he said. We're interested in doing what he did. And that's sort of two different things. And in particular, there is one, well, actually, let me say a few more things about that idea of doing what he did. So that's where the Bodhisattva path you know, a bodhisattva is kind of a, a Buddha in training, right? They're like headed for becoming a Buddha. That's sort of what the, what they're involved in doing. And so that idea of, oh yeah, I, I'm not going for becoming an arahat, a, a, a worthy one, which actually I should say a little bit more about that. But the idea is, is that in the early path, you wanted to, the goal was to become one worthy, uh, one worthy of offerings. But the Bodhisattva path is very different because it's about, again, becoming like the Buddha. And let me give you a major, like, <clears throat> um, a, a major difference in that. 
and this is what I thought of a moment ago. So the early Buddhist path, which is very monastic, we know that about the that path. It's it's focused on renunciation, whether you're a monk or a nun. And the idea is, is that you live, one lives a very meager lifestyle. They do a lot of cultivation, a lot of practice. And what that looks like in in <clears throat> like in a lived experience is there's a, a a group a large group of lay devotees and these lay devotees yeah they're they're buddhist they may or may not do any meditation or anything like that but these lay devotees are very devoted to supporting the monks and the nuns. And so it is considered a great opportunity that if they come around begging for food or whatever it is, that if I give them offerings, if I give them of food or clothing, I get punya, I get the merit in return for that. And as a monk or a nun moves up the level moves up in terms of their cultivation they just become more and more pure more and more purified thus making the the punya that you get in return for the the offerings it's more you get more the more pure that person is until eventually in the early tradition, if you're a male, you can become an arhat, the, the worthiest of them all. And what that looks like in kind of a Southeast Asian traditional Buddhist environment, there's a term for this. It, the, Buddhist, the Buddhists don't use this term, by the way, but the, it's a Hindu Sanskrit term. What begins to happen is that the, the purified monk, they basically are doing something that is called uh, darshan. Darshan is this idea of, of that you are, you are blessed just by looking at an arhat. They're so purified that really actually just looking at them, you know, you, you get transform forget about if you gave an arhat a little food or a little clothing but my point is this was a very long way to make the point that in the early buddhist tradition and the theravada tradition that survives today the monks are not actually there to teach they are there to be purified beings to be examples of what you too could accomplish if you followed the Buddhist teachings, you too could have such good posture. You too, you know, could be worthy of offerings and basically have notoriety and that kind of repute, uh, repute in that way. So again, the only person that taught was the Buddha and the monks will share with you the, the sutras. They'll share with you the the teachings of the Buddha, but traditionally, they themselves are not dispensers of the Dharma. Traditionally, <clears throat> there are, of course, many, many acclaimed Theravadan teacher monks in the modern world. So I'm kind of speaking very generally. But my point in general was that the goal of that early path and the goal of Theravada is just to become purified via the teachings of the Buddha. The Bodhisattva path, on the other hand, is different because, again, the Bodhisattva is going towards becoming a Buddha. And what the Bodhisattva path, what the Mahayana recognizes is, oh, and a really, really big part of the Buddha's, like the Buddha's life, was 45 years of teaching the Dharma. <laughs> and so bodhisattvas, and I should mention this, I was going to mention this a little bit later, 
but I'll mention it now. So in the Mahayana tradition, upaya, this idea of skillful means, it becomes, um, well, it basically becomes a seventh paramita. And if you remember, you know, the paramitas are these bodhisattva, <clears throat> these bodhisattva practices like giving, patience, meditation. So there are these six paramitas that are the foundation of the bodhisattva's practice. But at a certain point, and by the way, <clears throat> when one first starts doing the bodhisattva practice, like one first starts that path, you automatically begin practicing all six paramitas. Like it's not that you work on number one for a while until you're good enough for number two and then work your way up to number three. They're all at once. But you do actually work your way up to upaya. And so what I mean is, is that the bodhisattva path eventually leads towards becoming a teacher, a Dharma teacher. But you don't start off as a Dharma teacher. You do the initial training. And then eventually you employ the seventh paramita, which is this idea of skillful means. But this is where things start to become even more divergent from that early poly use of upaya. So as we noted, and this is kind of Noam's question highlighted this or, or kind of uh, pointed this out, in the early tradition, upaya are or were prescribed. They meaning they were already established techniques, counting breaths, using a kashina, all of these different things. So you kind of had a basket of upaya to choose from in that way. And again, it was a very personal, like. Like, you know, I'm having trouble focusing on my meditation. Oh, I could focus on my breathing. That's a great upaya. So these prescribed basket of upaya in the early tradition, in the bodhisattva path, the whole upaya thing becomes very different. And I'm going to, I want to try to do this in a few different steps, but the first step and, and this is sort of the real message of upaya, at, at least Mahayana upaya. So this is about teaching. Oh, and I wanted to say this too, you know, that even though we're talking about Buddhism right now and Dharma, I really do think that upaya is something that is applicable to pedagogy in general. It's applicable to teaching anything. <laughs> If you teach anything, it, it, then this is sort of uh, appropriate or kind of applicable to that discipline. Because upaya, as, a, as an aspect of teaching, rather than these sort of, mm, let's call it techniques, rather than these techniques of the early tradition, the Mahayana tradition is actually a little bit more interested in the way that the Buddha always teaches using similes and parables and metaphors. So my first point is that Mahayana Upaya is much more focused on, on metaphor and simile. Like that's really what it's interested in. But even better than that, you know, similes and metaphors are, are interesting. They're very subtle. And, you know, like you, you take like allegory. Allegory is another kind of example of, the, of this. Allegory is very subtle. You know, you have one story going on at this level, but allegorically characters represent things. And so there's kind of a, a, a meta story going on at a different level. So upaya in terms of similes and parables are very poetic, 
very subtle teaching techniques. And what I mean by that is, is that, you know, even, even Jesus used parables to teach. So it's sort of like, it's seemingly at a certain point when your message when your message is so profound and so otherworldly, you basically eventually have to resort to similes and metaphors. Like, and what I mean is that every great wise teacher throughout the world has seemed to eventually get to the point where, okay, well, it's like this, <laughs> and then can tell you that. So the, the Buddha used all of these parables and similes, and... For a while in the Mahayana tradition, the upaya was now about like, how can I put this? The upaya was now, it was a little more dynamic, not so prescribed. It was a little more um, um, like pot potentially anything could be an upaya in the Mahayana, because it's it's about a metaphor and, and you know you could compare anything to anything else in a certain way. And so what begins to happen is you kind of start to get this very, oh, it almost gets mystical at a certain level where because they're being so, um, so well, so metaphorical in that way that things start to get very interesting. And let me let me cut to what I, what, what I want to say. So in terms of the bodhisattva path and, and the bodhisattva practitioner, eventually they become one who employs upaya. That, that's, again, part of the, the seventh paramita in that way is now you're, the, the bodhisattva is employing upaya except this isn't exactly like telling people to count their breaths. Although that might be an upaya, it, it very may well be. But what I'm getting at is, is this, and I've used this example a lot for upaya. So forgive me if you've heard this one from me a lot, but so for me as a Dharma teacher, it, it could be, and this used to happen more often for various reasons, but it could be that I would be invited to a high school to, to give a Dharma talk. And it might so happen, just for the sake of this example, it might so happen that I get invited to a chemistry class. And the idea is, is that me as a Dharma teacher, Bodhisattva, if I'm, if I'm going to like, what would be an upaya is if I could come up with a really good example using chemistry, because I'm talking to a bunch of chemistry students. And so if in that moment, I was, I was trying to explain uh impermanence the buddha's teaching of impermanence why i could use an example about like various laws of thermodynamics and entropy and the way chemical like compounds decompose and i could use again if i were really upayak i could use a chemistry example to point at impermanence and the idea is is that it it might click because that group of chemistry students might be like, whoa, that, oh, that's what the Buddha's talking about? It's success. That's upaya. Now, the interesting thing about it, though, is, is that you might want to say, all right, I, I've got this great uh, chemistry impermanence upaya. And that's good because tomorrow I have to give a talk to the woodshop class. And so now imagine I go into the woodshop class and I'm like, okay, it's a lot like entropy. <laughs> and they're kind of like, huh, what's entropy again? <laughs> I'm like, you know, laws of thermodynamics. And they're like, yeah, what are those again? 
so then I'm like backtracking and explaining what, uh, you know, entropy is in order to explain. And it's, and they're just scratching their heads going, well, I don't understand. I'm not into, I'm not into the Dharma. It sounds confusing. That would not be upaya, fail, L, like total loss. Like that would not be upaya. But wait, it worked yesterday. My example worked yesterday. Why didn't it work today? And that's the more subtle thing going on with upaya in the Mahayana tradition. The idea is, is that in the Mahayana tradition, upaya sort of emerges in the moment. It's not prescribed at all, at all, at all. In fact, it is entirely about responding to the present moment. And again, you know, I made my comment a little while ago about upaya is applicable to anybody who does any teaching. And anybody who has had good teachers or bad teachers, you can probably trace it back to upaya. Because a good teacher can make things like applicable to your life and can make them resonate in that way by using examples. Bad teachers, in my experience, use dusty old curriculum that's wrote, that's been taught the same, they've been teaching it the same way for 20 years, it's been taught the same way for 20 years, and is not dynamic. So it's not upayak in that way. So that's a kind of very interesting aspect of upaya, is this, or the Mahayana upaya, this idea that it, you, you won't know it's upaya until it's happening. In, in that way. And that makes things very interesting, <laughs> to say the least. Any questions so far? I have a few more points on Upaya. Cool. So basically what I wanted to get around to was the idea of, well, so it's more than, or now we're going to focus just on teaching the Dharma, not teaching anything using Upaya, but specifically the Dharma. And what I want to get around to is, is that now what we're interested in, if we're thinking about the Mahayana, is we are interested in expedient, skillful ways to deliver the Dharma, to teach the Dharma, to, to explain the Dharma in that way. And if you're looking at it like that, that that's what we're interested in is expediency and skillfulness in delivering a message, then the thing to think about then is a sutra as an upaya. like the actual text as an expedient, skillful way of delivering the teachings. Now, the thing that I want to like, yeah, this is something that I always like to remind us of. We live in such a literate text-based culture and society that reading and writing and communicating via email and text is so second nature. Oh, sorry, I'm just gonna. I'm sorry. Hey, uh, David, could you mute your mic real quick? And I don't have seem to have that ability. Anyways, what I was gonna say, thank you. What I was gonna say is, is that nowadays when we're so inundated with text, it can be a little difficult maybe to see exactly how magically weird it is in that way. And what I mean is, is that 2000 years ago, it was a, it was a new technology in that way to be able to put some symbols on a piece of paper and then deliver it thousands of miles away. And they like open it up and can like, 
read the message that like comes out of a letter or comes out of something like again we, we it's so second nature to us that to to recognize it as like a magical mystical skillful means but my point is is that well or actually what i would probably i didn't even think i would mention this but i you'll find it interesting you know some of the oldest writing is that we know of is buddhist writing the oldest known book is the diamond sutra the vajra sutra in fact that book the oldest known copy of the vajra sutra is also the world's oldest printed book and the buddhist or a group of buddhists seem to have invented printing uh this would have been in the 800s so that was a long time ago but the point is is that if you read like if you read about or read things from that era it's kind of clear that they weren't looking at at the printing process as like hey guys I discovered a new technology that's going to revolutionize education. It was about, this is a great way to deliver the Dharma. <laughs> this is a great upaya. <laughs> and so my point is, is that there's the, the Mahayana tradition is kind of very cognizant of sutras as upaya, like as these kind of living upaya in that way. So that's a very kind of interesting way of thinking about it. And that's kind of basically leading me, or that's my segue back to our sutra, our, our wonderful Upayak Sutra here. The only last thing that I'll mention, yeah, I'm kind of wondering if I should mention this now or later. I'll mention it now because I might not get back around to it, but it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting relationship between upaya and tathata, suchness. So we've done a bit of talking about tathata or suchness. And this is this idea of like things sort of as they are, so so to so to speak. But one of the things that I want to mention about that is, so let me grab my, let me grab some upaya real quick. So I often mention or have talked about this idea of this clock, right? And what we've talked about when I've mentioned this clock is the emptiness of this clock that a clock is a concept in that in that way. And when I say that this, I know that it looks like a clock, but it's, it's not, you sort of are imagining that this could be perceived as a clock. And, and the idea here is, is that if I hold this one up, you're, you're more, you're more easily able to understand how this is not a clock but it looks like a clock whereas this one also looks like a clock but you might Buster, homie. <laughs> my cat is going crazy over here sorry <laughs> so this one you might be inclined to think is actually a clock this just looks like a clock but you might think this one is actually a clock but what if I told you this clock doesn't work? This clock doesn't work either. So there's actually not a lot of difference between these two in that neither of them are actually timekeeping devices, but they both conjure in your mind timekeeping devices. So if you followed me on that quick review, what we could say is, is that they are such in that they appear to be clocks, but they are not. 
like absolutely inherently clocks. And that should be review, at least if you've been coming to Dharma doors. And what I wanted to point at was how suchness or tathata is about things appearing like a bird, a flower, a human, what have you. And the idea here is, is that the teaching of Tathata is about being wisely aware of, oh, yeah, this is not inherently a clock. It looks like one. This is not inherently a human. It looks like one. So it appears like one. And so the idea is, is that there's sort of this, um, a relationship of suchness, tathata, and things appearing as such. And that's that other translation of tathata as suchness. So what I'm getting around to, and I'm going to say this again, and I know it sounds like I'm just repeating myself, but so this isn't a clock. It's like a clock. It looks like one. And what we want to notice is, is that right there, when I say that it looks like a clock, that's a simile. Remember, you learned this in high school, right? Similes use like or as. So it's like a clock. So I hope this isn't a little too subtle, but what I'm getting to is the sort of the, it, it kind of has to do with this really mysterious thing about how everything is in Upaya, because everything is like that thing. And the, well, all I wanted to get around to with this is, it's sort of about like, well, so there's a very famous Zen saying. And the very famous Zen saying is, don't mistake the finger pointing at the moon for the moon. So the finger is a pointer, is an indicator. And the idea here is, is that the finger's pointing at something but you might get too lost in the finger. And the idea is, is that a simile or a parable, an allegory, these things, they, they point to things. But if you get too hung up on the thing, you'll miss what it's pointing at. And once again, the idea is, is that these upaya are, are similes. We're saying it's like this. Emptiness is like how this isn't a clock. So I, I definitely feel like I've gone off the deep end, but I just wanted to draw a connection between tathata as suchness and upaya as simile and noting that they are both operating in a realm of similitude, a realm of, of that kind of pointing in that way. So what that might that this might make more sense later, which is why I thought I might talk about this later. So it might have been too early, but Tanya. Yes, yeah, so the way I mean it's the way that I'm interpreting it is like everything is a simile, essentially. Um, if you're thinking about is that that's kind of what you're pointing to, right? It's like everything's a simile when you think about suchness. Nice. <laughs> Exa exactly. And it's sort of like, well, it, I, there, I did it right there, but I, it's sort of that idea of as somebody who uses the word like too much is actually kind of correct when they're, I was like, it was like me, like, like with this person who was like there, like there, if you constantly qualify everything as well, it was like I was teaching a Dharma class to what was like the San Francisco Dharma Collective, it would be more appropriate <laughs> that way, so.
again, I think all of this might make sense. Yeah, yeah, question. <laughs> I'm just wondering, geologically speaking, um, confusing us right before reading the sutra seems like the yeah it seems like some upaya <laughs> from your end that i've experienced before so because i am fully confused but yeah um but now we read and did you say upayologically i mispronounced that no <laughs> yeah, i don't Upa, i think upaya logically yes i don't think you can mispronounce it when you are the one who is making the word up it, it is it is pronounced any way you decide <laughs> yeah tanya yeah I, I like that tongue twister but <laughs> um i was also thinking i can't remember i'm, I'm probably not going to get this right but there's a saying or another thing about like don't mistake the raft for the what, do you know that one? Oh, absolutely. In fact, and that sounds I, to me very similar to like the moon one that you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. So for those who don't know what Tanya's referencing is uh, the fa a famous part of the Vajra Sutra. There we have the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra again. And the Vajra Sutra has this really, really important moment. I forget exactly which chapter off the top of my head. But basically, it's a discourse about the dharma the teachings in that way and it's sort of about well it's very complicated but what the buddha eventually gets around to talking about is the idea of the right dharma and the wrong dharma like the right way and the wrong way and eventually what comes out of that chapter is the buddha says that everything all of this dharma it's all upaya and that it's like a raft that you use from get to get from one side of the shore to the other side of the shore. Now, in a famous parable of the raft, the Buddha says that it's only a fool who continues to carry the boat on their head once they're on the other shore. The boat is just a tool to get over there. And in the Vajra Sutra, the Buddha says, and my Dharma is just a raft it's just a tool to get you to the other shore and what he says in that chapter is actually the 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 dharma like my teachings they should ultimately be abandoned how much more so the wrong path <laughs> so it's a great kind of ultimate example where it's sort of like um, the it's like the appropriate way to paint yourself out of a room. And what I mean by that is, is that there's a right way to do that, a right way to paint a room to where you're painting the correct thing last and then stepping out of the room. And the idea is, is that there's a correct way to go about the Dharma. And at the last step, you let go of even that Dharma teaching that has gotten you there. So that's the Tanya's reference. By the way, Tanya, I'm really glad you mentioned that because the Vajra Sutra has now popped up a couple of times in regards to Upaya. And it's funny because I was going to bring up the Vajra Sutra for a whole other reason. So let me get the Sutra. So tonight, for various reasons, I'm going to read from the Treasury of Mahayana Sutras. I might look at my translation. I might look at my translation and I might look at the Tibetan, but I'm going to probably mostly stick to this one. So, um... Yeah, I won't say too much about the backstory. Most everybody here, I think, knows the story of the sutra so far. We are coming to the end of this sutra, though, I will have to say. We're very close to the end. The major um, sort of discourse has been given. And we kind of now have even concluded the conversation that's been going on between the two bodhisattvas between Bodhisattva Manjushri and this Bodhisattva Lion Courage Thundering Voice. And 
now that sort of we're winding things down, we have this question. So then, sorry, this is reading a little bit. Well, so this is in, in line with where we were last time. This is after Manjushri has finished kind of his statement about that he's not even seeking enlightenment. So I think it's in, it's in the Tibetan version. I think that's why I'm a little confused. But the Bodhisattva asks about and I think he might have even asked it earlier, but the Bodhisattva has asked about sort of like the, the arrays, the arrays of virtues of Manjushri's Buddha land. How, like how beautiful, how wonderful, how marvelous will Manjushri's Buddha land be? And that's sort of where this conversation started where Manjushri was like, I don't even seek, I'm not even seeking enlightenment. So how can I talk about my Buddha land and all of that? But then the Buddha steps in and he says to the Bodhisattva, uh, Lion Courage, have you ever seen or heard of the Shravakas and Bodhisattvas in the assembly of Amitabha Buddha? And Bodhisattva Lion Courage says, I have, I have heard of them. I have seen them. And the Buddha asks, how many are there? And Bodhisattva Lion Courage says, their number is incalculable, inconceivable. So we're about to hear about how jam-packed full of Bodhisattvas and and virtue, Manjushri's Buddha land is. And even before we kind of get into the, the, the Buddha's example, because he's going to use a simile, he's going to use an example, I wanted to kind of mention something. So it has to do with this Amitabha pure land. I, I mentioned this a few nights ago, maybe even longer than that, but you know, this, this sutra that we've been reading, it's an interesting sutra because it's very, well, it's very aware of other sutras. It's very aware of the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra. And as we just noted, it's very aware of the Amitabha Buddha Sutra. And what I mean, and, and in fact, the Amitabha Buddha Sutra is one of the 49 sutras that's part of the Ratnakutna collection. But the Amitabha Buddha Sutra is a very old sutra. Like we have records, like manuscript records of that sutra going way back. And my point is, is that and, and I don't, I'm not going to get too deep into pure land Buddhism, but that idea that there are these other Buddhas and other realms, and if you were to go west from here, you would encounter Amitabha Buddha's Buddha land. Like, this is all kind of an, a well-established tradition at this point. To, to the point where the Buddha is saying, hey, like, haven't you heard of Amitabha's pure Buddha land? And he's like, oh, yeah, like, who hasn't heard of Amitabha's pure land, right? So we're, my point is, is that things are about to go up a notch from all these other sutras. So the Buddha says, noble one. Compare a single kernel taken from a bushel of linseed from the kingdom of Magadha. Compare that one kernel to the number of Shravakas and Bodhisattvas in Amitabha Buddha's Pure Land. 
and compare all the remaining kernels in that bushel to the number of bodhisattvas in Manjushri's assembly upon attaining supreme enlightenment. And actually, even that comparison is insufficient. <laughs> but wait, noble one, if one compares the number of minute dust particles in this 3,000 great thousand world system to the number of kalpas for which universal sight tathagata will live, one will find that the former, even multiplied by 100,000 billion or by any amount, any numerical figure, is still less than the latter. You should know that the lifespan of universal sight Tathagata, which is the name of Manjushri when he becomes a Buddha, you should know that the lifespan of that Tathagata is incalculable, limitless. And now here's where it gets really wild. So tr try to hold on. Noble one. Suppose, oh, and by the way, just for anybody new in the audience, just to make this crystal clear, they use this term, 3,000 great thousand world system. And that's this Buddhist idea for not just one solar system, not just two, and not just a thousand world systems a thousand groups of a world systems, a thousand groups of a thousand world systems. Oh, wait, and actually a thousand of those groups of a thousand groups of thousands. So a billion planets or solar systems is what the Buddhists are talking about when they talk about a 3,000 great thousand world system. So, suppose somebody were to grind into minute dust particles a 3,000 great thousand world system, and then another person were to take a 3,000 great thousand world system and to grind it into minute dust particles, and another person did the same thing, and another person did the same thing up to 10 people. Then one of them takes all the dust particles of all of those world systems ground into dust particles by those 10 people. One of them takes all of those dust particles and heads towards the east dropping a single dust particle after they have traveled through world systems equal in number to all of those dust particles ground by those 10 people. So passing beyond that many world systems to the east, they drop a single dust particle. And then they travel again to the east, past as many worlds as all of those particles of dust ground, and puts down another particle of dust. After they pass again through the same number of worlds, they drop yet another dust particle. And they do this until they have dropped all of the minute dust particles. And then the second person does the same thing to the south. And then another person does the same thing in the other direction and the other direction until the 10 people have done the same thing in all 10 directions, including the zenith and the nadir. So this continues until the same is done in the west, the north, each of the four intermediate directions, the zenith and the nadir. Noble one, 
could anyone know the number of all these world systems that have been traversed through by those 10 people? And Bodhisattva Lion Courage answered, no. Then the Buddha asks, noble one, suppose these 10 people were to grind into tiny dust particles every world throughout the 10 directions that they had passed through during the previous exercise, whether they had dropped a dust particle there or not. What do you think? Could anyone know the number of all of the dust particles through counting? Bodhisattva, thund lion courage answered, no world honored one. Anyone who tried to count them would become immediately confused and would not ever be able to know their number. Then the Buddha said, noble one, all Buddhas, Tathagatas, can know the number of those tiny dust particles. Even actually a greater number than this is knowable to the Buddhas. So I'm going to pause there. I want to chat about what just happened, but it's not over yet, but I want to pause there. So I, I mentioned this once before that in the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, the Buddha mentions the idea of grinding a world system into minute dust particles. That's sort of the, the Vajra Sutra seems to be the, the point of origin for this particular type of hyperbole. And there's a lot going on with this. You know, on the one hand, you know, like, what are they even talking about? <laughs> right? Because on the one hand, they're the Buddha is supposedly trying to tell us how many, I guess, how many bodhisattvas are going to be in Manjushri's Buddha land? And by comparison, we're being led on this, you know, psychedelic journey of, of world systems upon world systems. And again, uh, you know, initially, I guess we are to understand that this is the most expedient way to explain Manjushri's Buddha land. But that's where I don't think that that's what's going on here. <laughs> and that I think that the upaya is actually the mental exercise of imagining, even trying to imagine what I just sort of described. And what I mean by this is the absolutely mind boggling numbers that are kind of being suggested that you think about right? Because the amount of dust particles in my room <laughs> is uncountable. <laughs> the amount of dust particles right here is inconceivable. So forget about grinding galaxies and galaxies and galaxies. And then using all of those in unimaginable dust particles, using that as a point of reference for this other exercise, if, if you follow what I'm saying, where we've already been asked to, con to conceive the inconceivable, and then we're gonna use that as our point of reference for how many world systems we are zooming through in the, you know, into the point where the mind is stretched to the absolute limits, and then the Buddha asks you to wrap all of that up, grind it into minute dust particles and count those. <laughs> I would strongly suggest that the upaya is in the journey in that sense. <laughs> There's nothing really to find there except the limits of cognition in that way. <laughs>
Okay, any questions come up from the reading so far? Ideas? Pretty straightforward as far as these things go. Oh, and by the way, too, if I hadn't kind of mentioned it in this way, this kind of hyperbole, I think that might be the best word for it, but this kind of hyperbole, it basically becomes like a genre of Mahayana Sutra, like where all it's about is is sort of pl playing in these unimaginable psychedelic kind of scenarios in that way. And I know that when I first, as a student, when I first encountered these sutras, they were not my, they were not my preference. I was definitely more, um, I mean, I still am very philosophically minded, but in my younger days, I was much more philosophical in that way. And so if I were to read something like that, say 20 years ago, I would have skipped right past it. I, I wouldn't have even bothered because I was more interested in like, no, oh, you know, tell me about the emptiness or tell me about the, the, you know, the philosophical stuff that I can kind of wrap my head around. And it was only sort of later that I kind of, first of all, appreciated what was going on with that type of hyperbole, but it was later that I realized how, how actually, how more interesting that is than some of the more like straightforward philosophical stuff. That in many ways that is doing or saying the same thing, but with a little more pizzazz, if you will. It's got a little more uh, poetry to it in that way. But again, when I first started re reading them, I couldn't see the point. And when and and kind of like um, well, kind of like a lot of things in life, it's the point isn't like that. It doesn't have that kind of point. And when you realize that, you can kind of get more into the, again the, what I described as the journey of it. And, and not be worried about that you're getting somewhere. Is there a question in the space? I, I mean, I was, I was just going to say, I mean, it makes me think of like, I've heard people talk about like, they'll, they'll kind of bring up the fact that, okay, yeah, like you can kind of get a basic understanding of evolution and you're like, okay, great. These changes, whatever, inherited law, you know, survival crap. But more recently, like they'll add in like, you know, the part that's not intuitive is like, just the numbers of generations and it's like this this isn't going to be intuitive mm. because these numbers are just too great and and it's hard to you can it's hard to appreciate that like that's part of the mechanism and the one that's like the least intuitive and i don't i don't know if that connects to this this feels like the buddha's being annoying but <laughs> um but I, I i yeah i mean it seems like yeah i don't know it'd be interesting to hear where it goes but like you know the difference between a lot and an unimaginable a lot versus <laughs> you know something that's unit you know one thing or a number of things but yeah um yeah brendan your your comment sort of makes me remember something that i wanted to bring up again so it's sort of about well, I mentioned the, the Zen saying about the finger pointing at the moon, and that was a, sort of part of another idea that relates to, to what Brendan said. So you might also all be very familiar with the famous Zen koans. And these famous Zen koans, you know, um, what is the sound of one hand clapping? And the idea is, is that a koan like that, the classic you know, what is the sound of one hand clapping, right? The idea is, of course, is that these those koans of the Zen tradition, they have, they are definitely upaya, that is for sure. And the idea of those is that, of course, they do not have a rational answer. But they are not useless either. They serve a different function. In many ways, the function of a koan is to sort of point at 
the limits of language, the limits of certain ways of thinking. You know, for example, the sound of one hand clapping. What you, and I, it, I don't even want to do this. I don't want to make it sound like koans have answers because I'm about to rationalize it. So I'm about to do what you're, it's not even that you're supposed to like not do it. It's just counterintuitive to say the least. But my point is, the this is to clap <laughs> is to have two hands it's built into the definition of clap. And so when you ask the question, what is the sound of one hand clapping? You are pointing at the very definition of a clap and sort of messing with it by taking away <laughs> an important other part of it. And, you know, I have seen, for example, I have seen people who say, you know, what's the sound of one hand clapping? And they can actually clap you know they can magically actually clap with one hand but that's a very rational direct way of answering the question what is the sound of one hand clapping like literally <laughs> one hand clapping of course but that's not what the koan is meant to do it's meant to challenge the mind that thinks a certain way by certain definitions and then the koan is meant to sort of mess with that to ultimately dismantle that. So koans are these, again, they're kind of an upaya, but a koan is like a sentence, a, you know, sometimes even a word. You know, there's the, the a famous koan you know, about the question of whether a dogs, whether dogs have Buddha nature or not. And the monk answers, mu. And that's a single word. And it doesn't mean no, by the way. <laughs> In Japanese, it doesn't mean no. It literally kind of means, <laughs> it, you, it doesn't mean anything because it, it's, it, ah, I never thought of this actually, it just clicked. So if you've heard that uh, koan, do dogs have Buddha nature? And the answer is mu. That Japanese character mu, wu in Chinese, it, in English, it would be like the prefix un, un. But in English, you have to say un something, right? Or in, uh, in uh, unimaginable or indisputable or, but un by itself doesn't exactly mean anything. And it's the same way in Japanese where to say mu, you haven't actually said anything, but you have implied this un, this negation. And so again, I'm rationalizing these koans. I really shouldn't be doing this, but the, the idea of that answer of do dogs have Buddha nature mu, it, that answer is not no, they don't. It's more like answering emptiness. <laughs> Do dogs have Buddha nature? Emptiness. <laughs> and that's the right answer in that sense. Anyways, my point about that was koans might be a word or a sentence, but they have this purpose of sort of dismantling rational ways of thinking. And I would suggest that this is just a very, very long psychedelic koan <laughs> in that way. That is, oh, and by the way, too, you know, there are other, ver you know, uh, th th like I said, the uh, hyperbole becomes a genre. And Part of, so part of, <laughs> part of the, um, this genre that is uh, so hyperbolic, a lot of it is actually, it's a mental exercise in just trying to hold on to what they're talking about. 
like meaning so imagine you take the world you know the whole universe and grind it and the thing goes on for a while that you actually normally get a little lost and you have to or you don't have to but you would then go back and start the sentence over again and so my point is is that just reading these and trying to imagine is a type of visualization meditation which is basically an upaya in that way so if there's one thing i want want to really get across tonight it's that in the early buddhist tradition upaya were very well defined techniques for meditation and in the mahayana upaya are wild like again it, they are uh downright mystical in that in that sense so one of the reasons why i'm shooting at all of these different examples at you tonight is because i'm not trying to exactly say something rather point at a bunch of things in that way so yeah noe cool um the 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 upaya and the suchness it, it 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 for and and including this this innumerable infinity that's being described puts me in the moment it puts me in the right now this is where i have to be i can't be anyone where else that is infinity <laughs> eternity is not a place or a time or anything it's it's the now and this is also just pointing at the right now uh, uh the suchness of this right now thank you thank you noe and to that noe to that beautiful comment i want to point even more at this present moment and this is another thing i hadn't thought of uh mentioning but it seems really appropriate so i, I might have said this many nights ago but in the example that we just read through with the the dust particles you you may recall that we were imagining that these dust particles we were imagining that we were heading to the east past world systems and then to the south and then to the west and then to the north and then the four intermediate, and then up, and then down. And those are, of course, what are called the 10 directions. And the, the idea of the 10 directions, that gets referenced a lot in these sutras. But something that I didn't, I haven't mentioned lately, is that there's something really, really significant to the 10 directions. And it has to do with Noe's comment about being present. So anytime the Buddha or in these sutras, anytime they're talking about the 10 directions, the first thing you kind of need to kind of realize or recognize is that the 10 directions extend out from where you are at. The, the 10 direction, it's above, it's that the zenith, the zenith is not above the North Pole. <laughs> the zenith is like in terms of my, uh, my subjective Buddha verse here, the zenith is that way, <laughs> the nadir is that way, and east is that way, west is that way. And so my, my point is, is that the 10 directions always extend out from you. And these exercises that then are visualizations of, okay, now extend that to the east, now extend that to the west. The visualization, you are meant to be doing it literally from your state of being. And that drives the the visualization even more into the present moment, the present location, meaning literally right where you are, and then the present moment when you are that way. So 
All right. So let's read a little bit more so we can finish out this section. So. So yeah, this is where all of a sudden Maitreya, the future Buddha, who is in a bodhisattva here. So then the bodhisattva Maitreya jumps in and says to the Buddha, world honored one, in order to attain such great wisdom, bodhisattvas should never give up the pursuit or should never give up the pursuit of that great wisdom, even if they go through extremely grievous suffering in vast hell realms for incalculable billions of kalpas. The Buddha said to Maitreya, so it is, so it is, just as you say. For who would not desire and enjoy such great wisdom, except those who are lowly and inferior, or those who are lazy? When this wisdom was explained, 10,000 sentient beings engendered bodhicitta. Then the Buddha said to the bodhisattva, lie in courage. Noble one, what do you think? Manju Shri will follow the bodhisattva path for kalpas as numerous as the tiny dust particles in the worlds throughout the 10 directions wherein those prior 10 people passed in their dust dropping exercise. <laughs> why will man, why will Manju Shri follow the bodhisattva path for that many kalpas? Because inconceivable are Manju Shri's great vows, his determination and pursuits. So are his lifespan and assembly of bodhisattvas after he attains supreme enlightenment. Bodhisattva Thunder Lion Courage said, World Honored One, Manju Shri's aspiration is so great, and so are the practices that he cultivates. Never does he get weary, even before kalpas as numerous as dust particles just mentioned before. And Manjushri said, so it is, so it is, just as you say. What do you think? Does the realm of space conceive the idea that it endures for days or nights, months, seasons, years, or kalpas? Bodhisattva Lion Courage said, no. Manjushri said, so it is, noble one. Those who comprehend that all dharmas are in reality equal to space, they have no discrimination. They have subtle wisdom, and they do not think I endure for days, nights, months, seasons, years, or kalpas. Why? Because they have no thought of dharmas. Noble one, the realm of space never thinks that it feels tired or afflicted. Why? Because even after kalpas as numerous as the grains of sand in the Ganges River, the realm of space will never arise, nor will it be consumed by fire and ruined. The realm of space is indestructible. Why? Because the realm of space doesn't exist. Therefore, noble one. If bodhisattvas understand that no dharma exists, they will have no burning afflictions and no weariness. Noble one, the name space is free from destruction by fire. It is devoid of all burning afflictions and feels no fatigue. It does not move. It does not alter. It neither arises nor ages. It neither comes nor goes. The same is the case with Manjushri, 
Why? Because a name is devoid of self-nature. And when this Dharma was spoken, the four great heavenly kings, Chakra, Brahma, and all other gods in the heavens said in unison, the sentient beings who hear this Dharma explained will certainly acquire good, great benefits, let alone those who accept, practice, read, and recite it. It should be known that the good roots they achieve will be very extensive and great. World Honored One, we shall all accept praise, read, recite, propagate, and circulate this profound Dharma teaching because we want to protect and uphold it. Okay, so I'm going to pause there because I do want to mention quickly that beautiful section. So that last section about being like space, the realm of space being indestructible. So I really hope sort of, at least for right now, that you were here last week or you watched last week's because last week we talked about the idea of space. So last week we talked about space. Yeah, right. So last week was the Dharma talk on space and the section where Manjushri was talking about effectively be or not being like space, but he was referencing space a lot. And so I did a whole Dharma talk on the realm of space. And so I can't repeat that, especially this, this late this evening, but I do want to mention, you know, if, so if you remember that Dharma talk or go back and listen to that Dharma talk. So he's continuing that idea of kind of the, the space like nature of enlightenment in that way. And so this idea that this idea of space being indestructible. And it's like, on the one hand, if you think about space the way we talked about it last week, you can quickly be like, well, yeah, space defined as such isn't anything. If you remember, space sort of is what we use to understand things, but space itself isn't a thing. And if you're thinking about it that way, then space by virtue of not being anything, space is therefore indestructible because it's it's things, it's things that fall apart and become destroyed. Space doesn't fall apart and get destroyed. And so another aspect of that that's really interesting is that space doesn't age, right? So this a beautiful idea, right? That there's no day, month, year, uh, that space doesn't think, I endure for a day or a year. And then what Manjushri says at the end there is this idea, well, I'm gonna paraphrase, I don't wanna reread it exactly that way, but if you kind of remember what we were talking about last week, and in particular, there was a brief moment where I was sort of talking about the space body and kind of the meditator inhabiting a space body, by which I mean sort of, um, well, this is getting complicated, but I want to reference that idea that I talked about last week. But what I'm getting at it at is, there's a way of understanding this is going to be uh, um, this is going to be a tricky one, be a subtle one, but there's a way of understanding that that this physical body ages and falls apart and kind of leads to destruction or is destroyed in that sense. But there's a way in which that it, so I uh, there's so many different ideas right now. My my little upaya engine is going crazy. It's like how do I how do I get a good example in here? But 
what I want to point at is So we talk a lot about, or I've mentioned, well, I even mentioned it a little while ago, so I'll use that one. So I'm going back, I'm grabbing what I said earlier. What I was talking about was about how this isn't a clock, but it appears like a clock. So it doesn't have the inherent nature of a clock. And then I said that thing, which is that I might appear to be a human, but it, according to the Dharma teachings here, I don't have the inherent nature of being a human. And of course, the reason why I don't have the inherent nature of being a human is because being a human is relative to being a bird or even being a inanimate object. And we know from all of our talk about big cups and little cups and all of those things, we know that the characteristic of being human is a relative understanding. It's again, it's relative to a bunch of other animals that aren't human, that I am then considered human. But anybody looking at this saying that's a human, they definitely then think about all those other animals and they're like, yep, that's not a monkey, that's not a dog. That's a human. And of course, the idea that I might be a tall human, we know the tallness isn't here, the, hum the humanness isn't here, all of these different things aren't there. And now the wisdom of emptiness that we're talking about, the wisdom recognizes, oh, whoa, there's nothing fixed there. <laughs> there's no characteristics here that are fixed. And that is sort of a, a realization of the emptiness of the self. This is Avilokiteshvara realizing that the skandhas are empty. So what I want to point at from the sutra is how, when you understand that about the relativity and therefore no inherentness to all of these things, you recognize then, oh, I'm not tall or short. And I'm not old or young. I'm ageless. Because if you, if you can understand how it is that I am neither tall nor short inherently, then you can also understand how I have no age inherently. The age will always be relative to something else. If, if only, if only relative to the sun and the earth moving around the sun. But my point is, is that age and time and all of that, all of that is relative. And so the level of enlightenment that Manjushri, and remember we're at the end of the sutra, so this is about as exalted as it gets. But here the idea is, is that that true nature of the self, the true empty nature of the self in that way, indestructible ageless, timeless. That's, for me, that's very interesting. I don't know about you. <laughs> so that's time. We're not done with the sutra, so we'll keep going next week, but that's it for Upaya, at least for now. <laughs>